All right. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Dan Enger here. And today I am very honored to bring to you Stefan Kinsella, a real life patent attorney with a very different perspective than what you may be used to. So um, if you're new to this channel, you know, my, my main thrust is to help first time physical product inventors and startups. And today we're going to talk about protecting your idea uh, in ways that you may not be familiar with, particularly without reverting to this constant patent. I got to patent my idea. That's like the knee jerk reaction that everyone has. But, uh, you know, it's one thing for me to tell you to be skeptical of patents, but, you know, this guy, uh, again, is a true, you know, practicing patent attorney who has decades of experience. So it's a lot better to hear it from a, you know, an industry professional. But let me just give you a bit of background here. So, uh, you know, you know where, where the man's coming from. So, uh, Stefan is an American intellectual property lawyer. He's got over 29 years of experience in patent, IP, and general commercial and corporate law. He's worked for clients such as Intel, GE, Motorola, UPS, and more. Uh, you know, if I were to go down the guy's resume, it would probably take 10 minutes. So I just want to give you the highlights, but he's written books uh, ranging from uh, international investment, political risk and dispute resolution. Uh, I, he's one of his, uh, I would say, most controversial books and probably one that's most centered on this topic is called Against Intellectual Property. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. And if you know anything about libertarian philosophy, he's really a heavyweight in these circles as well. I mean, he's, he's been around and contributing to the philosophical conversation for a long time. But uh, anyways, you know, we want to focus first on the practicality of like Maybe maybe we want to rethink this whole intellectual property and patent thing, and and then we can kind of wrap it back to like not just a pure selfish like how do I benefit myself as an inventor, but even more importantly in the bigger picture is you know maybe this is a better way to uh, to organize society it, you know having private uh, mechanisms for protecting ideas or for allowing innovations to flourish rather than, you know, just we need the government to do it, right? So, you know, Stefan's all about finding free market uh, and innovative solutions rather than just laws for everything. So um, anyways, I'll shut up. And uh, Stefan, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here, Dan. All right, cool. Well, why don't I just start <clears throat> out with a question? I think it's sort of the elephant in the room. And that is, uh, you know, you're a patent attorney who's written a book called Against Intellectual Property. So for most people, they're like, I can't square that circle. So can you give us, you know, the quick, like, like how, how can we make sense of that? Because it seems like totally contradictory things to the average lay person. Uh, it does. I think it's because they're used to people basically being unprincipled and doing whatever whatever butters their bread. You know, so you expect public school teachers to be in favor of public schools. Um, post office workers to be in favor of having a post office. Um, I guess people in the military in favor of taxing me and you to pay for the military. Um, but of course, there's a natural reason for people to favor things that benefit them, but that doesn't always mean that they're right and that everyone is sort of, say, corrupted by self interest. Um, you know, there are lots of uh, oncologists who get paid because there's cancer. Their job in life is to fight cancer, and they hope that they could get rid of it. And there are attorneys who are paid to defend people uh, from the drug war or from tax laws, even though they're libertarians or they're conservatives, and they're opposed to the drug war, and they're opposed to taxes. And if they had their way, those laws would be abolished, and they would be out of a job, or they'd have to find some more productive, honest employment. So if you assume that there is an argument against the patent and the copyright system and that there may be bad ideas or not as good ideas as everyone says, if that's the case, then you would expect some people who know something about it to be ones that figure that out, and that would include patent attorneys who practice. So it's the only surprising thing is that I would actually be courageous enough to say in public that I oppose the system that I'm working within. But that's not that much of a surprise because number one… My saying it's not going to hurt me because I'm not going to instantly cause the system to be abolished, although if I could, I would. I mean at best, we could have a gradual reform, or even if we abolished it, it would be a 20-year uh, transition period, and that would just give lawyers like me more work, <laughs> unfortunately, cleaning up the mess. Um, 
you know, and I found in my career, I've been doing this like 28, 29 years now, patent law. Um, at first, I was a little bit afraid to say it. So I would be very timid, like, oh, maybe we should consider some arguments against it. Because I was afraid that my employer, the law firms I work for, or my clients would be upset by that. But what I found is no one cares. And in fact, it's, got, it's gotten me business because people don't care what your political personal views are any more than they care about your religion, right? Um, but if they hear you speaking vociferously about a topic like patent law and copyright law, they assume you know what you're talking about. Like they don't care if you're against the system. They think that if I talk so much about it, I must know what I'm talking about, like about how the law works and the right. So they want to hire me to do their patents, even though I'm against the patent system. So, so anyway, there's no there's no contradiction at all in my view. I mean, uh, I think I would have discovered that patent and copyright law are a bad idea, even if I had not practiced it. But one reason I turned my attention to it because I was a libertarian and interested in this topic, and the arguments for it never made sense. So when I started practicing it, I thought I'm going to be the one who's going to figure it out, like because I'm a libertarian. And I actually understand the system, which is very arcane. Most people that talk about it don't really understand it because they get patents and trademarks and copyright confused and all this kind of stuff. So I thought, okay, I'm the one libertarian who actually knows patent law from the inside out, so I'm going to be the one who's going to figure it out. And I tried for about five years, and I finally kept butting my head against the wall. I finally realized why I couldn't and I, I, that, that the whole thing is totally corrupt and should be abolished. Um, now, that's not to say that people shouldn't uh use the system in our given society given that it exists and that's what my job as a patent lawyer is um i view my job as a patent lawyer like a guy who sells locks to people or guns or bullets i'm arming them to do something uh and especially like locks you know in the old days when you live in a safe community you might not lock your door because no one's going to break in but but when crime goes up you need to have locks, and that's an expense, and you have to hire a locksmith and a lock company to buy it, and that's an extra cost of life that's required because of the existence of crime, and the locksmith is in business because of that, um, and that's sort of what I do. So because there's patent laws and copyright, people need to be aware of them and to navigate them and to respond to them and even to sometimes use them because they exist, so people like me are necessary. So. Um, yeah, that's my situation. I've actually liked it because I deal with it. I'm an electrical engineer background, and I've, I've dealt, I specialize in electrical type inventions, especially lasers and things like that in the last 15, 20 years. And I've always enjoyed learning about new inventions and working with engineers and with companies. Um, but I also know that in a way my job is, is a waste and a drag on society and that it's a shame that these companies have to waste resources, waste their employees' times, on getting patents just to hold them in case they need in case they need them to defend themselves if they're sued or to waste time defending a lawsuit the whole thing is a drag on innovation and business um hold on just a second dan i need to pause for a second no problem yeah go give for me it. just a second no problem okay sorry back um anyway uh, I guess I can pause there and let you follow up with any questions, yeah. but um, but um, yeah, that's my job now. And by the way, people don't understand patent law. Um, on the hypocrisy charge, I think you could level a hypocrisy charge against me if I was out uh, attacking people, uh, like aggressively using the patents. But in my career, I've always worked on the defense side. Um, that is either helping people obtain patents which they can use for good or for evil. So I'm like selling guns or bullets. People can use them for good or for evil or a knife. Um, <clears throat> but then when they uh, – on the litigation side, I have, I have helped companies only being, def being sued for patents, and I help them defend. And sometimes the defense would include a countersuit. So I have no ethical problems with countersuing someone who's suing you for patent infringement because um, they've, they've opened the door. But I would never help someone who wanted to use a patent to sue an innocent company because I believe as a libertarian that that's aggression and that's wrong. It's using power the state's given you to take other people's property in a sense, and I think that's wrong, and I don't do that, and that's the reason I oppose the patent system uh, in addition to the fact that I think it's um, a drag on innovation contrary to 
the propaganda that spread um, that is necessary for innovation, which is wrong. Right. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar, you know, the the philosophy that Stefan and myself uh, coincidentally are coming from is is a adherence to what's called the non-aggression principle, which is that it's it's basically morally wrong to initiate the use of force against an innocent party and and you know, it's okay to use force to defend legitimate property. Like for example, your house is a very clear form of property. But to say that you own an idea, something that other people can come up with simultaneously or, or before you or after you, it's not really much of a solid claim, you know, anywhere near compared to like physical property. And I just wanted to sort of like give people a background about the philosophy, but Moving on to another question. Well, um, before you go on, let me let me say one thing about that. Uh, for your listeners, especially because you mentioned a lot of them are just normal people, not libertarians. Um, the, 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 the understanding and the case against intellectual property, which would include patent and copyright, also trademark and trade secret, but the big ones are copyright and patent. Um, you don't need to be a libertarian uh, to be to understand why these systems are a problem. They're a problem on their own terms. In other words, the reasons given for these systems, um, they, they, these systems don't hold up even on their own terms. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the ethical reasons against them are just common sense as well. So if we, get, if we have time to get into that or anyone wants to, you don't have to be a raging libertarian like me to understand uh, basically patents, patents harm us all by making us poorer because we have fewer innovations and technological improvements than we otherwise would because it actually slows down the pace of technological innovation because it makes it illegal to innovate in some cases. It reduces competition. Um, that's number one. And number two, it's immoral, and you can explain that in common sense terms. You Basically, the government gives you a property right in someone else's property because it gives you the legal right to stop them from using their own resources as they want to. So copyright gives you the right to use state force, a court order to prevent someone else from printing a book using their own paper and ink in their own factory. And it prevent it, in the patent system would give you a similar right to use state force to prevent someone from making a machine in their own factory using their own materials, their own workers, their own factory, their own raw, raw inputs, their own energy. It makes it illegal to do that. Um, and that is wrong because it, it's taking away a property right you have in your property. That is the right to use your property as you see fit, as long as you don't harm anyone else with it. So that's the basic case against patent and copyright. And you don't need to, that's not a libertarian argument. That's just an argument appealing to common intuitions and values that we all have, like the value of common prosperity and innovation and the value of, of respecting property rights. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm kind of torn in two different directions because on one hand, I want to, you know, completely aside from any moral questions, I was going to ask, like, in today's world, um, you know, regardless of the fact that the patent system is, you know, a giant behemoth that, that just slows us all down, are there existing solutions to, to not only protect your idea, but in fact, do a better job of it? Like, you know, things like using those resources to get to market faster, uh, yep. to you know, th things like that. And then on the other hand, I was also going to ask, like, a lot of people, they, they do have this strong moral intuition that, hey, like, it was my idea, and you stole my idea. Right. But it's, you know, that's a very surface level thing. So you're welcome to address either one of those. I think it, at, at, at this point in the conversation, it's, it's all fun and interesting anyways. So, you know, <laughs> well, let's talk about the latter just briefly and then the, then the more practical thing. So on the, you stole my idea thing. Um, well, even if that's true, uh, you still have to live in a world and you have to confront reality. So, you know, streaming music now is so easy and piracy of music is so easy that the business models that face artists and creators like musicians and filmmakers is is has to adapt in the face of that. Even if you think it's theft to copy someone's song, which I don't think is theft. In fact, it's, it's not theft even under the law. People call it theft and stealing and piracy, but those are euphemisms. Copyright law does not say it's theft to copy someone's song. It says it's copyright infringement and there's a remedy for that. There's a damage payment, but it's just infringement and it's an artificial thing the law makes up, but it's not theft uh, because theft means taking someone someone has and they don't have it anymore. 
if I copy your song, you still have the song. So Can it's I not theft. For that for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I, I get that argument that, you know, piracy doesn't take something away. Like I, if you copied it, you literally made a copy, but the argument would be like, well, I, I had, they, they feel an entitlement to be the exclusive producer. Correct. Of now I, I guess yeah, that's, but yeah. yeah, yeah, and so and and I, look, I've I've been arguing about this for thirty years now almost, and I, I I see the the way the argument is twisted in people's heads because this is a difficult thing and they haven't thought about it. They've listened to the propaganda about it and they've in, they've ingrained this IP mentality. So yes, a patent is an exclusive right to sell something, which is a monopoly. It means you can outlaw competition for seventeen years or so. Um, but they argue for it by saying it's my idea and it's stealing if you're not. So they're they're claiming that it's stealing to justify the monopoly. And then if you if you challenge them and say it's not stealing, it's copying, they back off of that claim and they say, well, yeah, but well, they'll they'll retreat to what you're they'll just retreat to saying, well, I should have a monopoly. But that was the original thing you're supposed to prove. And you were trying to prove it by saying it was stealing. And then when I show it's not stealing, you just say, Well, I should have it. So that's not an argument. But quite often what they'll do is they'll say, Well, you're right that it's not stealing my idea if, if you copy it like for, for, an, for the design for a new iPhone or a machine or the pattern of a book or a novel or, you know, a novel or, a, or a song or a movie. Uh, but they say, but if you can copy it, then you can take my profits. So then they change their argument yet again, and, and they, instead of defending the ownership of an idea because – you can't own an idea because you can't steal it, right? You can only own something that can be stolen, and ideas can be copied but not stolen. So then they retreat to the second argument, well, you're stealing my profits. Okay, but they didn't want to make that argument in the first place because when you put it in those terms, which is the argument they're making really, it becomes clear why it's wrong because everyone who's an entrepreneur understands you don't have a right to profits. You don't have a right to make money. All you have – because profit is just the money you have left over from your sales after you subtract your costs. But the sales is the money that's owned by potential future customers that might or might not decide to pay you to give it to you in payment for something, right? So you don't have a property right in your in potential future profits because that means you would have a property right in the money owned by potential customers. By the same token, when we have free market competition and you have a business, um, your competitor is trying to quote unquote steal your your customers. And we use that language. It's not rigorously precise, and we use it. But what we mean is that, well, they didn't even take your customers because you don't own your customers, right? But what right. they did was they found a way to persuade your customers to spend their money on you instead of on the other guy, right? So, But the customers own their money. They're entitled to do what they want with their money. So you can say he stole my business or stole my profits, but you don't really have a property right in those profits. And exactly the same thing is the case um, with patents because patents simply protect you from competition, but free market competition is what we're supposed to be in favor of. So that on, that's just on the ethical side of it. Um, on the practical side, uh, what I would say is like as a patent attorney, as a business lawyer, as someone who's advised hundreds, thousands of clients… It, mostly inventors and um, companies with inventions. Um, you do have to be aware of the system, but I think you should also be aware of its pitfalls and not buy into all the propaganda about it because that will mislead you into wanting to overuse the system. In other words, yeah, you might have to obtain some patents for certain practical reasons, which I can get into, but maybe you won't get as much. Maybe don't waste as much money. Like, in other words, maybe spend the minimum possible on IP. Like enough to satisfy your investors because they're going to want you to have a patent system because they've been bamboozled by the logic too, right? <laughs> or maybe they want you to hold in your hip pocket that if your business idea doesn't work, maybe you could sell your patents to a patent troll and we'll get some money out of it, you know, like as a as a remnant corpse of the of the failed business. Um, it's just some remaining assets. So you're going to need to to get investors uh, like venture capital to invest in your company. They're going to ask on their on their little questionnaire, you know, their little check checklist of things that they want. Make sure you're incorporated properly. Make sure you have insurance. You know, make sure you have a headquarters and you're not some fake ghost office somewhere. Uh, make sure you have a business plan. Make sure your sales are true. You haven't been lying. Also, do you have a good IP pro program in place? And what that means is, 
do you have a system in place where you're not going to be sued into oblivion tomorrow by – like you're not infringing someone else's patents. They want to make sure that they're not giving money to a company that's about to be sued into oblivion by a competitor or by a patent troll. So have you done your due diligence to make sure you're not infringing other people's patents? And number two, do you have the right licenses that you need for any patents? And number two, are you exploiting your IP resources properly so they're not going to waste? In other words, are you, are you meeting with inventors regularly to make sure that they don't have any, any, invent, any ideas that you could pat, file a patent on? Are you filing patents? Do you have a good law firm lined up? They want to see all that. Um, so you can't just say, well, we're against the patent system, so we're libertarians. You know, Screw that. That, that's not going to wash. So you need to be reasonable, right? So you do need to say – if you say, look, we have a patent law firm. We're doing what we do. We're spending a moderate amount. We, we don't want to do too much of our resources to it, but we're doing what we need to. Our patent attorneys should assure us this is within the, the realm of the normal, so we're obtaining patents and things like that. But what you could do is you could say, but we're adopting a policy like some companies have done, like say Tesla or Twitter, like say Tesla adopted a policy because they understand how dangerous, how damaging the patent system is even to themselves. Because if you start being reliant upon whatever invention you happen to be able to get a patent on, you might not a adapt to a new field because you're reliant upon this little monopoly protection. So it might limit your dynamic flexibility, right? Maybe you should. Maybe you should modify and go to a different line of business even though you don't have a lot of patents on it already. So the patent can, can, can be like handcuffs. You want to be free of those handcuffs. So you don't want to let the patents you happen to have uh, limit what you choose to do. right? You want to focus on the business, and so you might have a light touch. You might only get a few number of patents, and Tesla knew that they're in a dynamic growing market of electric vehicles. They know that people need to have power stations around the country, for example. To make this market work, right? Because there's gas stations every on every corner, but there's not a Tesla charging stations. So they wanted competition because they want five or ten other electric vehicle companies, so that there will be a bigger market to build up the technology and the standardization and the electric charging ports everywhere, so that the electric car market gets big enough to be prosperous. So Tesla would rather have ten percent of a ten trillion dollar market than ninety percent. Of a five hundred million dollar market, right? They'd rather be a medium fish in a huge pond than a big fish in a tiny pond, right? So they intentionally forswore the use of patents because they have a lot of patents in this area, and they said we're not going to sue anyone for patents. Any competitor is free to use whatever we're doing. So they actually intentionally didn't use patents in hoping to grow the market because they kind of implicitly recognize that patents. Slow down competition in markets. This is similar to the software industry. The software industry has largely forsworn the use of copyrights for software with the entire uh, free software movement. You know, they use open source software licenses, so they could use copyright for software, but they choose not to because it slows things down. Most software nowadays that people use is 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 open source under the GNU license or copyleft or something like that. Um, so people are trying not to use. The IP systems when they can. Um, and another thing you could do is like what Twitter did was Twitter says for ethical reasons, which is good PR, and also to attract the right employees who had to have a, a modern pro technology streak, they said, We refuse to be a patent aggressor. That is, we're going to make a pledge that we will, we're going to have patents and we will keep them in our back pocket for defensive reasons. If someone sues us, we will counter sue them, like the porcupine approach. But if you leave us alone, we won't go after anyone else. And the way they did that was they they adopted a policy, and saying something and making a policy is easy to say. Talk is cheap, and you can always just change your mind. But what they did was they tried to tie their own hands by signing an employee employee agreement with every employee who might be an inventor, and it, and it gave a license to every employee in the patents that they come up with. Making the company get their permission before suing someone for an aggressive purpose. So let's say you have a Twitter employee who comes up with an invention. Twitter patents it. Twitter owns the patent. The employee leaves the company. Now Twitter wants to use that patent to sue a competitor in an aggressive way, like not in a defensive fashion but aggressively. They have to go back to the employee who left to get his permission. So he probably won't grant it because he has no reason to grant it. So it's a way of tying their own hands. So they've. So some companies could think about those models. 
I talk about these strategies you could use in my book, uh, my monograph of Do Business Without Intellectual Property, which I sent you the link to, and people can look up on my site, c4sif.org. Um, other things you can do is you can join defensive patent pools or patent leagues where people get together in a similar industry, and they all agree to pool their patents together and not to sue each other. Uh, in other words, they just want to do competition in a fair and square manner. They don't want to be distracted by IP lawsuits or even by suing people to make money off of that. They just want to make products and make money off of that, and they're, they're fine with free market competition, and they all agree not to sue each other. This is sort of like the Soviet Union and the United States having uh, you know, mutually assured destruction. They're not going to sue each other. You know, They've all agreed not to sue each other. Uh, I'm sorry, to, 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 to hit each other with nuclear weapons. Um, and, and then also the patent pooling aspect means that if an outsider, someone outside the pool tries to sue a member of the pool, then any member of that pool, they could look, look through their own pile of patents as something as a, as a counter weapon to sue this guy with, or they can look among the patents of their fellow members in the pool, and if they find a patent that one of their fellow members has that could be used as a weapon against the guy suing them… They can take a temporary license from the guy and use it as a weapon. So they all kind of pool their resources to, to add to their defensive armory. So it basically turns the patent system, the patent, uh, the patents that you collect into more of a defensive thing to let you go about your business and to minimize your cost. So there's lots of things that are like that that are kind of creative and outside the box that people don't typically think of. And if you go to your average patent attorney, they're just going to say, pay me money. I'm going to get you as many patents as possible. And then pay me an additional amount of money, and I'll meet with you every quarter to look through all your existing patents and review all your possible competitors' behavior, see if there's anyone we can sue to get some money. right? And then if we sue them, you got to pay me for that. That's going to be a million dollars for my fees to sue someone. Uh, and if so, if someone sues you, you can hire me too, and I can you can pay me a million dollars to defend you from this lawsuit. And if you lose, then you have to pay another ten million to them. So you know, that's what you're going to hear from your typical normal patent law firm who has never even thought about whether patents are a good idea and doesn't give a damn and just want to take your money, right? And they're just going to go with the system and do the easy thing. But you can think a little bit creatively, like a lot of high tech companies are doing. And not be not be sucked into this. Wow, it's it just goes to show you know the the innovations of the free market are always ten steps ahead. Uh, you know even figuring out how to sidestep this this old archaic system. So I I just have one more question for you because this is this is excellent and it's all very interesting and dare I say you know highbrow ivory tower type stuff. But to bring it to earth for because like I said, you know, my audience is at the end of the day, just average, you know, almost desperate people just trying to start up a simple physical product. And they're like, okay, I understand, you know, patents may not be the best way to do that. What would you, if you had to boil down some advice into just, you know, a few minutes, if possible, what would you say to them, uh, you know, regardless of, of ethics or morals or, or et cetera, mm -hmm. and money being, generally the biggest constraint of all, mm -hmm. um, what the hell should they do, you know, knowing mm -hmm. that now that their yep. contents may be slightly eroded, what, what would your sure. advice be? Well, okay, so this advice is mostly for independent inventors, because if you're anything beyond that, you're probably going to be an employee of a company, and they're going to make you sign an agreement, or it's going to just be the default law in, in the state um, where the employer owns all the IP, and they handle the policy, so it's really not up to you. Um, but if you're an independent inventor or a small company, you started yourself or something like that. Um, um, when, when, so first of all, never do a design patent. Okay, there, there are like a few types of patents. The normal patent everyone thinks of is called a utility patent. That's a normal patent that has usefulness. It's, it's an invention. It's a, for, for, a, for a practical device or process. Okay, a design patent is like a cheaper quicker, easier patent to get, which just covers the ornamental features of it. It's kind of like a copyright almost. It's just the way something looks. Those are almost always useless, uh, except in some cases, like Apple got one on a four-cornered, rounded corners iPhone, but usually it's a useless thing. And usually it's, it's these kind of, these bottom feeder 
patent attorneys or patent agent shops that try to sell you these, 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 these ads you see on TV, you call them up and you say, I have a new idea. And they say, we can get you a patent on that easily. And all they do is they file a, a drawing of what it looks like and they get a design patent in, in a few months and it's cheaper, but it does you no good. And you go around telling people, if you go on a shark, if you watch Shark Tank, you'll see that the, uh, some of the, pat the sharks are a little bit savvy about patents, like Laurie Grenier and Mark Cuban. And whenever they say they have a patent, they'll say, is it a design patent or a utility patent? Because if it's a design patent, it's totally worthless. So don't be taken in by these scam – they're scam artists, I think. They're, they're scammers. Uh, so do not do a design patent. That's number one. Um, what you typically want to do is before you approach a big manufacturer – uh, especially in China, because they they're not going to respect IP on the on the ground level, um, uh, or even a big company to maybe license it. The danger is if you don't have a non disclosure agreement signed, um, and usually they're going to be reluctant to sign one with you because that's a, they're they might be walking into a, a patent trap. I mean, a litigation trap. You might be trying to set them up. So you go to you go to a big company to say, hey, I've got this idea. You can improve one of your products. I need to disclose it to you, but I'm going to want you to sign a non disclosure agreement so that you can't steal my idea. Right? Um, they're not going to sign that. And even if they do, it's what are you going to do if they if they steal it? So it's better to have some kind of patent filed before you disclose it to anyone other than your attorney um, so that you could prove – and the and the, there's two ways to do that. You file a patent on it, but it's – the way IP works is it's really easy to do your own copyright. In fact, copyright's automatic, but if you want to register it, it's cheap and easy. You can do that on your own. Trademark is a little bit more difficult. You can usually hire a trademark attorney, but you could figure it out on your own, but – you know, and then patents are the hardest to do on your own. Some Some engineers get good at it, but it's really – it's not easy to learn for your yeah. typical engineer. So you want to hire a lawyer. So you're going to spend eight, ten, twenty thousand bucks on a patent, which is usually not within the budget of someone who's a small independent inventor, or it's not a smart use of funds if you're not sure yet about the idea. So the most practical thing is to file a provisional patent. Now, most patent lawyers will tell you not to do that for two reasons. Number one, they're correct. They're not as good as a regular patent, and you might mess it up. And number two, they want you to pay them 10000 bucks, <laughs> so they will tell you you're an idiot if you do a provisional. But I hate this kind of advice because this is stupid lawyers putting – making the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean if you can't afford to do a $10,000 patent, it's better to do a provisional patent than nothing else. So what you do is you just write the document up as a technical document that describes it in the best you can, and you, 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 go, to, you go online to the patent office website, and you figure out how to file it. And it, I think it's seventy five dollars for the filing fee. It's really cheap, and you file it, and then you get a filing date, and you get a provisional patent application number. So basically, that gives you a one year window, where you have one year to convert that, in essence, to a regular patent. Um, but that, so when you're about ready to start approaching people to license it or to manufacture it, you file your provisional, and then you start going, right? And you try to figure out something within six, let's say six months. So you try to get some idea within six months about whether this is really an idea worth pouring money into, right? Or maybe someone wants to buy it. Maybe the big company you approach says they're impressed that you have this idea and that you have a provisional patent. They know they can just buy the invention from you and the provisional patent, and then they can pay their patent lawyers to convert it to a regular patent, and they might pay you for all that, right? So they, then it's out of your hands. Uh, on the other hand, if no one's interested in licensing it from you or whatever, but you, you think that you can make it make a profit, well, then at that point you say, okay, I'm going to raise 10000 bucks and I'm going to pay a patent lawyer now to file a regular patent on it right before the one year is up. So, But it gives you some time to decide whether you really do want to spend the, the big bucks on getting a regular patent. So that's how I would approach it, um, and the problem is I've given this advice – Hundreds of times, and I would say people act on it about two percent of the time. It's just unfortunately the way it is. They they never follow the steps I just laid out, but that's the right way to do it. Um, like they dither, like they, they 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 take they don't file the provisional and they approach someone first and then they get ripped off, or they file it but then they wait nine months to finally get start approaching people and then by the time they know, the one year's expired. You know, or the so you got to do it, like I said. But 
that's I think that's good advice for an independent inventor starting out. And um, that's just the core of it. There's lots of other little things, you know, but that's the basics. That, well, I feel I feel validated because that's exactly what I tell people in my webinar and in my training. I train inventors. I say, don't get a patent right away. You are going to blow the tiny amount of money that you already have, and it's not going to unlock any more funds for you. You're better off. You know, there's a lot of other things you can do. Do the PPA first and kick that can down the road. Well, in any case, uh, Stefan, this is an extremely interesting and enlightening topic. And, you know, we could go on forever and ever. And, you know, your work, if anybody's interested, you know, learning more, this man's work is like just libraries. He's, he's done so much. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to look into, you know, alternative uh, ways of, of managing our society. Like, I, I don't want to get into that too much, but, uh, you know, it's called, it's called voluntarism and it's a philosophy both Stefan and I share a strong passion for. But in any case, I would say this is a good time to, uh, to close out the conversation. Once again, thank you for your time. And if you have anything else you want to throw in there, uh, go for it. You can list, you know, your website or whatever, but um, I really appreciate the chance to speak with you. Yeah, well, my libertarian stuff is at stephankinsella.com and my my law website is kinsellalaw.com, but but most of the stuff we talked about today is all collected on C4, the number four, sif.org, um, and there's resources there, the practical resources and the um, the stuff about why the patent system is is so harmful, uh, and copyright as well, and uh, yeah, people are free to look at that. And one of the I, I, I talk about this on my website in some places, but one other strategy people can consider is instead of filing a patent, if you don't want to file a patent. And if you want to keep other people from patenting the same thing, you can just publish it. You can just publish your invention on your website, and then other people can't patent it. Yeah, you public you make a disclosure. So that's another option some people have. And I mentioned that in my my do business without IP book. But isn't the public disclosure? I thought it kicks off a twelve month window. Uh, but if somebody were to file something within twelve months of the public disclosure, as long as like you know, there's the first inventor to file, so they'd have to prove they're the inventor. I, I suppose, and they didn't learn it from it's you. Comp, it's it, yeah. Well, they can't if they learn it from you. They're not the inventor, uh, and okay. I think it's pretty. It's pretty rare that people lie, but uh, the the twelve month thing is complicated. I think it depends. It depends on whether you're the inventor or whether someone else is. In other words, right. if you publish it, then you have twelve months yourself to file. Okay, right, right, right. But I think I think if you file it, if you publish it today, everyone else it affects right away. It's complicated. I kind of forget well, the details. They don't lie and try to prove that they were the inventor, which some people will obviously try to do, right? Uh, but yeah, because that's I've yeah, and I've never seen that in my whole career. I've never seen anyone lie. Um, the most I've seen in terms of lying is when people misstate the inventive entity. In other words, let's say we have three guys that invented it at a company, and one of them leaves, and he refuses to sign the papers. So you take the easy way out and you just take them off. That's actually a no-no. You're supposed to list everyone, and if he refuses to cooperate, there's a way you can get around that, but people don't want to take that. So that, that actually can threaten the validity of the patent, and I've seen that done before. And on the other hand, you know, sometimes three guys will invent it or one guy will invent it, and his supervisor wants to be listed on the patent. You can't do that. With copyright, you can. With patents, you cannot. That's actually another note because they're both, they're both in violation of an oath that has to be sworn to the patent office. You have to tell the truth about who the inventor is is you cannot list someone just to be nice to them and people do that all the time and that actually th threatens the validity of the patent uh, although it's very rarely brought up because it's hard to prove but theoretically you only want to list the inventive entity the people that are actual inventors now sometimes you're not clear who it is and you, you have you can have leeway in deciding you know if you're not sure you might list someone but you can't just make someone up and you can't leave someone off if you know they're an inventor awesome good stuff well, Stefan Kinsella, everybody, and that's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A.com. Check out his stuff. And uh, of course, you know where you can find myself. I'll, I'll put links you know, beneath the video, et cetera. So once again, sir, really appreciate the chance to meet you, to chat with you. I've been kind of on the sidelines for the last five years, you know, watching your stuff. So appreciate the opportunity and, um, and I hope you have a great rest of 2021. Thanks, you too. Okay.